Hello, and welcome to the Scratch Me Life Kitchen. My name is Kim, and today we're going to make Buter Kesa, which translates to butter cheese. Buter Kesa is a wonderful German cheese that I discovered when I lived in Germany for three years, and it's exactly what the name says. It's very buttery, the texture is very creamy, it melts really well, it's great on a grilled cheese, it's great in a fondue or just on a crack or all by itself. It is just one of my absolute favorite cheeses. Very, very, very hard to find in the United States. So when I started making cheese and I found a recipe, I was so excited and it is always in my home now. So what do you need to make butter queso or butter cheese? We're gonna use two gallons of milk. I have milk here from our partner dairy in Modesto, Valley Milk Simply Bottled. You need one packet or a quarter of a teaspoon of buttermilk culture. You need a quarter of a teaspoon of thermophilic culture. If you're using raw milk, you're gonna half that. You're gonna need some rennet. I use vegetable rennet. You can use whatever kind you want. Just remember if you have vegetarian friends in your life, they're not gonna eat your cheese unless you use the vegetable rennet. And then you're gonna need some calcium chloride if you're not using raw milk. Now, what kind of milk do you need to use for making cheese? Well, there is a video on my YouTube channel that I encourage you to check out that goes into some great detail for you. But I'll say for the purpose of this video, do not use ultra pasteurized milk. It will not work. You cannot make cheese from it. Uh, for more detail, again, look at my video. So we're gonna get started. Now, the first thing we do when we're making just about any cheese is we heat the milk. We heated it, heated the milk in this case to 86 degrees. Once it reach te reaches temperature, you're gonna remove it from the heat. And then we're gonna add our buttermilk culture and our thermophilia culture. Now here is something really important to you, for you to purchase. This is a set of stainless steel um, mini measuring spoons. And the measurements along with the temperature, really, really important in cheese making. So these are two things that are gonna cost you less than $15 total uh, that you need to purchase when you start making cheese because the temperature and the measurements of your ingredients are critical for your cheese turning out to the cheese you want it to be. Now, if things are off a little bit, you're probably gonna get a good making cheese, good tasting cheese, but it's probably not gonna be the cheese you set out to make. So these two are really important to have. So let's start by add or adding our packet a buttermilk culture and I kind of tap it all the way around the top like that and then I'm going to take my thermophilic culture and if you're using pasteurized or pasteurized homogenized milk you're going to use a quarter of a teaspoon if you're using raw milk you're going to use half of that and so I'm going to get my six or my eighth of a teaspoon here and I'm gonna dab it across the top, just like I did the buttermilk culture. Now, both of these ingredients are dehydrated and you store them in your freezer. So in order to incorporate them really well into my milk, I'm gonna to need to let them sit and rehydrate for a few minutes. So while it's doing that, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what these cultures are gonna do. The cultures are gonna activate the good bacteria in your milk, and they're gonna start making the wonderful flavors and aroma that we need to make the cheese that we're gonna make. And so as you start getting into cheese making, you're gonna notice that different cultures are used, different amounts of different cultures are used, used with different heats. That's where you start having the variables to make the different kinds of cheeses that we have out there. Um, but the steps are all very similar. So you're gonna always start with heating your milk and then you're gonna add your culture. Sometimes you add other things at the same time, but I'm not gonna to get too far ahead of myself, okay? So after this has rehydrated and we stir it in, we're gonna let it sit and ripen off the heat for 60 minutes. Now you might read in some recipes, it says maintain the temperature at 86 degrees. Well, how do you do that? You do that by using a stainless steel pot with a reinforced bottom and leaving the lid on it. Milk retains its temperature very, very well. And I guarantee you that unless your kitchen is very, very cold, over the course of that 60 minutes, it's not gonna drop more than a degree or two. All right, so we're gonna stir. Now what's really important is that we get these cultures thoroughly mixed in with the milk. And to do that, 
we use a slotted spoon so the milk can go through the spoon as we're stirring. And instead of stirring round and round and leaving that area in the center unaffected by what we're doing, we're gonna stir up and down. So these ingredients are on the top of our milk and so we're gonna bring them down to the bottom. And you're gonna stir around your pot, round and round, about 15 to 20 times until you get those ingredients thoroughly mixed in with your milk. Because we want the best result we possibly can have, and we're gonna do that by getting our ingredients completely integrated into the milk. And then like I said, after we do this, we're gonna leave it off the heat for 60 minutes and let it ripen. And again, that's the period in which your cultures start to work its magic to make the wonderful flavors and aromas in our cheese. All right, so let's do this. Let's put the lid on there and you can go get a cup of coffee now or you can start making dinner. And when we come back, we'll show you what the next step is. Okay, so our 60 minutes is up. Our milk is nicely ripened with our buttermilk and our thermophilic cultures. The next step you're gonna do is you're going to heat your milk up to 104 degrees. Now, for those of you who have made cheese before, you might've been wondering when we use thermophilic culture, but then we only heated it up to 86 degrees, why we used a thermo culture. Um, because it, we are going to heat it up to 104 degrees. That's why. Um, for those of you who haven't made much cheese before, two basic kinds of cultures are mesophilic and thermophilic. Thermo meaning heat, so any milk that we're going to heat over 90 degrees, we're generally going to use a thermophilic culture. Anything under 90, we're generally going to use a mesophilic culture. So I thought that I would explain that to you so those of you who have done this before would know why we did it, and those of you who have not done it before would understand the difference between the two kinds of cultures. So after you heat to 104 is when we're going to do two steps if we've used pasteurized milk. We're going to add our calcium chloride to the milk. What calcium chloride does is it repairs some of the damage done by the pasteurization process. If you're using raw milk, obviously you're not gonna to need to use calcium chloride in your cheese making. Because I am using raw milk, I won't be using the calcium chloride, but at this point I do need to put in the rennet. And the rennet is a coagulant, and what it does is it starts the process of separating our curds in our whey, which is the first really big step we're gonna take to actually making cheese. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take a little small bowl, or a ramekin as I call it, and you're going to put about a quarter of a cup of unchlorinated water in it. Now the reason that we use water that doesn't contain chlorine is because that wonderful good bacteria we just started growing, the chlorine can destroy it. So only use water that does not contain chlorine. And for the most part, you only find chlorine in tap water, but double check, particularly like if you're a well or so on a well, it might have some seepage or something. Then we are going to add a half a teaspoon of rennet. And what I do is I take my, I've got a quarter teaspoon here, so I'm gonna do it twice. And I just do a slightly beaded measurement and you're gonna pour it in your water. So I need to do it twice because I need a half a teaspoon. And you're always gonna use the same amount of calcium chloride as you use rennet. So if you have a recipe and you're using pasteurized milk and it doesn't call for calcium chloride, use it. Calcium chloride again helps prepare the damage done by the pasteurization process and gives you a firmer, wonderful curd. So stir up your rennet a little bit. The reason we put it in the water is because you're using so much, we want to help it get a little bit more mixed into the milk, right? And so by adding it to the water, it helps us get a better distribution. And then we're going to pour it in through our slotted spoon. And we're going to move our slotted spoon around the surface of the milk. Again, to help us to get a very even distribution of our rennet. You're going to do the calcium chloride the exact same way. And then just like we did with the um, cultures, you're gonna stir it up and down and round and round about 20 times. So we get this mixed in really, really well. Always add the calcium chloride first 
because as you stir in the rennet, you're gonna feel a tiny bit of resistance starting. That means the rennet is already working at setting up the milk. It's already starting the coagulation process. It happens like that. So if you add the calcium chloride after you add the rennet, the calcium chloride is not gonna get into all of your milk and it's not gonna do the best job it possibly can in repairing the damage caused by the pasteurization process because the rennet will have already started setting up and it will inhibit that from happening a little bit. All right, so we've stirred in our rennet. So we did our ripening period for 60 minutes. We heated our milk up to 104. We added our calcium chloride. We added our rennet. Now we're gonna let it sit for 30 minutes. So let's set our timer for 30 minutes. And while I'm back over at the stove, I have a pot of water and I'm gonna heat that up to 106 degrees. And I'm gonna show you in a bit what we're gonna use that for. So let this sit for 30, 30 minutes, heat our water up to 106 degrees. When it gets to 106 degrees, put it on low, put a lid on it and let it sit until we're ready to use it. Um, if you're going, Kim, slow down. I can't write this all down. Don't worry about it. The recipe is on my webpage, www.scratchmeinlife.com. Okay, so let's get this magic going. 30 minutes. There we go. Our 30 minutes is up. The timer just went off. And the next step in making our Buddha case of cheese is to check for a clean break. So let's take the lid off. And what a clean break is, is when the curds and the whey start to separate from each other. That's what the rennet does. It starts the process of separating the curds and the whey. The curds that are eventually gonna be your cheese, and then the whey that you can use for whatever. You can use it in your smoothies, you can use it as a fertilizer in your garden, whatever. So let's check for our clean break. And I'm simply gonna do that by taking an icing knife. You don't need a special clean break checker thingy, my bobber. You can use this or you can use a chef's knife, whatever will cut through the curds. And I'm just gonna make an impression on the top here. You can see it kind of looks like a bowl of jello, right? And then I'm gonna release it. And see how that clear liquid is filling up the hole? That's a clear break, clean break. If that liquid was milky looking, I would put the lid back on and let it sit for five or 10 minutes. But because we have this beautiful, clear liquid right there. We're gonna go ahead and cut the curds. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna make half inch cuts. Now this is approximate. You don't have to do surgical precision or anything here. We're gonna do half inch cuts, vertically, horizontally, checkerboard. So let's start doing it this way. About a half inch. The smaller the cut, the more whey is going to get released from your curds. The bigger the cut, the more whey is going to remain in your curds. All right, so let's finish our checkerboard of our horizontal cut. Now, sometimes this can be so solid it starts spinning around while you're trying to cut it. Just put your hand on the top very gently and let it stop the cutting of your curds, or the spitting of your curds. Now for the vertical. Now you can get something called a cheese harp, and they're great for making nice even cuts, but you have to have one that's a half inch, you have to have one that's an inch, you have to have one that's a quarter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I just do them myself, the vertical cuts. So start towards the top and make about a half inch cut. Take your knife, go down a little bit lower, back it up, down a little bit lower, back it up, down a little bit lower, back it up, and down a little bit lower. And I find it more effective if I do it on all four sides of the pot. Back and lower, back and lower. So I'm gonna go over here as well. So pull it back, go down a little lower, pull it back, go down a little bit lower, pull it back, go down a little lower. Okay, now you can see all that whey starting to come in there. So your next step after you've cut them is to gently stir them so you can cut them down to size. So when you see the bigger ones, see those are, those are bigger than half an inch, 
just take the end of your spoon and gently cut them down. You're gonna do this for about five minutes, bringing them up from the bottom to the top so that you can see the bigger curds and cut them down to about five inches or half an inch for five minutes. That's where the five inches came in. So stir them, bring them up, gently cut them. And this is a gentle process. Now you don't have to, you know, like a gentle massage or anything, but don't go crazy with the stirring either. And from the bottom up, and just gently put the end of your spoon down through the curds that you see are bigger than a half an inch in size. And as you're doing this, you're gonna start to notice a little bit of rounding to happen. And what's going on is the heat, because it was 104 degrees, of the whey is helping to pull more whey out of your curds, which is what we want to have happen. Because if you leave too much whey in your curds, A, you're not gonna have the texture of cheese you want, and B, it can cause some bitterness. We don't wanna do all this work to have bitter cheese, right? So again, about five minutes to do this. And then after the five minutes, you're gonna stir it for 10 minutes. And what you're doing during this 10 minutes is trying to use the heat of the whey to expel more whey from the curds. You will notice your curds getting smaller. You will notice your curds getting a little rounder. You will also start to notice your curds getting a little firmer. And during that second 10 minute period, you're probably gonna see some bigger ones that you need to continue to cut down. And you see, when they're large, they look like they look like pillows, right? And we'll notice in a little bit, as we stir and they get smaller and smaller, they're gonna look firmer and firmer. It's gonna happen right in front of your eyes and it's gonna be really obvious, the transformation that's happening. So we're gonna just keep stirring for 10 minutes. Go ahead and set your timer. And then after that 10 minutes, you're gonna let them settle to the bottom because your curds weigh more than the whey. You're gonna check on the temperature of your hot water. It should be at about 106. If it's too hot, add a little bit of cold water to it. All right, so you keep, up, keep stirring for about 10 minutes. Put the cover on it, let it settle for five minutes, and then we'll go on to the next step. So you stirred your curds for 10 minutes, and then you let them sit and settle to the bottom of your pot, leaving the lid on. The reason we leave it covered is we wanna maintain the temperature as much as possible, because that temperature is helping to separate the curds and whey. Like I mentioned earlier, is important to getting a good solid curd and not having a bitter cheese at the end of the day. So what's our next step? So what you're gonna do is you're going to grab that hot water that you heated up to about 106, 104 to 106. You're gonna take the lid off your pot and you can see you can't see any curds because they weigh more than the whey at this point. They weigh more than the whey, did I say that? And they've settled to the bottom. So I'm gonna remove about a third of the whey. Now I like to capture the whey because as I was mentioning earlier, I like to use it for a lot of different things, and I do have a YouTube video on my channel about the different uses for whey, but you know, we love it in our smoothies. We love it instead of milk for our steel cut oats. Our garden loves it, particularly our tomatoes in the summer. Now I put this into a pot through a strainer so that I can catch any curds that might be sneaking out. And a third of the whey is almost to where I can start seeing the curds. Now I can feel the curds and I've got a few coming out, so I'm just gonna get a little bit more here. There we go. And then, as you can see, I've got a few curds in my strainer there. So I'm gonna put them back in there. And now I'm gonna take my hot water and I'm gonna put as much hot water in as I removed whey. There we go. And this is called washing your curds. Two, three. 
The reason we wash our curds is because this is the step that gives us some of that really buttery flavor, along with that buttermilk culture that we used at the beginning. And I know some Buddha Kesa recipes don't call for the buttermilk culture. I like to use it because it gives it a little added butteriness. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to stir these curds for about 30 minutes. And you can see from where we were before, they're already starting to break down. They're getting smaller, they're getting round. You can see the big difference in the size of the curds. So we're gonna stir for 30 minutes and we're gonna continue to break down the size of the curd. But this time, what we're doing with the water is we're creating a buttery flavor. We're washing the curds, mostly with water. There's still some whey in there, obviously. And as I'm finding big ones, I'm just very gently, 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 gently breaking them. I don't really want to do that much if I don't have to, but if do going like this is missing a few of them, just gently, I mean very, very gently, very gently. So you're going to stir these for 30 minutes continuously, not off and on, because as you're stirring, the hot water is washing the curd and removing more whey from the curd which is super important because this is not a cheese that we want any bitterness to whatsoever. All right, so you go stir your curds for 30 minutes and then we will do the next step. So you stirred for 30 minutes, curds got nice and small, round, and you are ready to go for the next step. Next step is to drain the whey out of your curds. So let's just go ahead. Again, I have a pot to catch the whey because I want to save it, and a strainer. And I'm going to very carefully drain off the whey. Just like that. And my strainer is going to catch any of my curds that come out. There we go. And I'll take the rest of these and put them back in here. And then I'm going to set this aside. And our next step is to mold our cheese. Now I have a two gallon mold here. It's my favorite to use. And I've sterilized some cheesecloth, so I'm just gonna line this mold with some cheesecloth. As you can see, I have a draining um, vessel along with like a really small baking sheet that I put it on that so the whey can drain without getting all over my counter. I'm just gonna line it with the cheesecloth that has been sterilized. And you can reuse cheesecloth, okay? And then I'm just gonna take my hands, but you can use whatever you want. I'm gonna take my beautiful curds that we got and put them in the mold. And I'm gonna gently, gently again, take the back of my hand and press them and even them out very gently. No need to be heavy handed with your curds. The natural expulsion, the slow expulsion of the whey helps to add to a nice balanced flavor of your cheese. And just very gently, and as I do this, I pull the cheesecloth up so that I don't have a bunch of ripples in the side of my cheese. Around and around. So I've got more curds in here. Let me get the rest of these curds in here. Raw milk will give you the highest yield more times than not than a pasteurized or a pasteurized homogenized milk will because it hasn't been processed at all. It's in its natural form. It's going to do what it's going to do. On the average, you're gonna get about a pound of cheese to a gallon of milk. So this is gonna be about a two gallon wheel of cheese. Now the milk I've been getting from Valley Milk Simply Bottled lately, um, I've been getting a few extra ounces per gallon. So this might be as much as um, two pounds, six ounces, two pounds, maybe even as many as two and a half pounds. But on the average, you're gonna get a pound of cheese to a gallon of milk. 
So if you do a two gallon recipe, you're gonna get two pounds of cheese. All right, so again, gently with my hand, while I'm pulling the cheesecloth up around it, I'm gonna get these even in the mold. Then I'm gonna take this extra cheesecloth and I'm gonna wrap it around my curds. This is so that we can form our shape. There we go. And then we're gonna take what's called a follower. Follower goes on top of your cheese and it bears the weight of the press and it follows the cheese down as the whey comes out of it. So I put it on there and I just press it down just a little bit. Now I've already got a pretty good amount of whey in here. So I am going to hold on to my mold and I'm gonna pour this whey off. And I'm gonna get my press. Now I have a very simple press and I love this. My uh, friend Steve and husband made it for me. And it's just two boards, four dowels. You put the weight on top of here. And I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna center this in my press. There we go. And I'm going to press it at four to six pounds for 30 minutes. What I'm gonna do is I have some weights, I have some five pound weights, and I'm just gonna set it right on the middle there so the pressure was right on the follower of the cheese. So in 30 minutes, we're gonna flip, and I will show you what this looks like. Okay, so our cheese has been pressing for half an hour at five pounds, it says in between four to six pounds, five pounds right in between, right? So you take your weight off, take the top off, take your cheese out of the press. Now you'll notice that this is wrapped in a towel. The reason being is you wanna keep these curds a little bit warm while they're pressing, somewhere between 80 and 90 degrees. And um, unless your kitchen is very, very warm, you're gonna need a little bit of assistance to do that. And you're gonna notice that there's whey in the bottom. That's great. That means that it's pressing the whey out of the cheese. So we're gonna take our follower off. And we're gonna use our cheesecloth to pull our cheese out of the mold. And we're gonna take the cheesecloth off. Do it kind of gently because I find sometimes when you're working with the thermophilic culture, your cheese will stick a little bit to the cheesecloth. So when you're using the thermophilic culture, very carefully take it off. Kind of like a, taking a Band-Aid off of, off of a scared kid. And then you can either flip it, or you're gonna flip it regardless, and rewrap it in the cheesecloth and put it back in here and then put the follower on it. Or what I like to do so I have a prettier cheese, my curds have knit together very, 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 very well. So I'm gonna take the cheesecloth off so that these ridges created by the cheesecloth are not an issue for me anymore. So I'm gonna take it in here, I'm gonna put it in my mold just like that and put the follower straight on it. Now what I'm gonna to have to do to get it out is I'm just gonna have to take it when I go to flip it again and tap the mold gently on my counter and it'll start to come out. So don't worry about it getting stuck in there because it will come out. Then I'm gonna put my follower on there, put it back in my tray to catch the way, put it back on my press and I'm going to do this about every 30 minutes for five to six hours. Now, if you go 40 minutes, that's fine. We wanna rewrap it because we wanna keep it warm. And then we're gonna put our five pounds of weight back on our cheese. Again, every five to six, for five to six hours, flip about every half hour. At the end of that five to six hours, you're gonna take it out of the press. So you're gonna take it out of the weight. You're gonna leave it in the cheese mold and just let it sit and relax overnight and let the temperature of the curds come down to room temp. 
Then the next morning, you're gonna put it in your brine and your brine for your butricasa is going to be two quarts of water for a cup of non-iodized salt. Now, earlier I told you what chlorine can do to our cheese. Iodine can do the same thing. It can interrupt the development of the cultures that are making your good cheese flavors, the bacteria from the culture, the good cheese flavor, all that good stuff, right? Right, okay. So we don't use iodine and we don't use chlorine. So water without chlorine and salt without iodine is what you wanna use in cheese making. After five to six hours in the brine, flipping halfway through, you're gonna take it out of the brine, you're gonna pat it dry, you're gonna let it air dry for just a few hours on each side. And then you're gonna age it at 52 to 55 degrees for three to four, maybe six weeks. Butercasa is one that's much better um, when it's younger. It's not one that ages super, super well. And so here is one that I have that is ready. This is a two pound, just like we are two gallon, just like we did today. I vacuum sealed it. If you wanna learn about more aging techniques, uh, you can check out my video on aging here on my YouTube channel. So we're gonna go ahead and just cut this in half so you can see what the middle of it looks like. And it's nice when I have one ready when I do a video about it because then we can, then we can do a little taste test just like they do on all the cooking shows. So that's what it's gonna look like. You're gonna see some little holes in there. Those are called mechanical holes. Those are from you know, some issues with the pressing. So obviously I might've needed to press for just a hair longer, um, but sometimes they just kind of happen. I like them, I think they're pretty. So let's take a little taste of this. It should have a nice buttery taste. It cuts like butter. It's really, really a nice soft cheese. I can tear it real easily with my hands. That's a beautiful cheese right there. It's really buttery, the texture is buttery, and it's got just a little teeny tiny bit of a tang. So there you go, there you have it. You now know how to make butter quesa. I almost guarantee you, particularly if you love a more mellow cheese, this will become one of your favorites, and you're gonna have it in your cheese cave and in your refrigerator on a constant basis. Want more information? Check us out at www.scratchmadelife.com or the Facebook page Scratch Made Life. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel if you've not done so already and continue to enjoy all these videos we've got for you. If you have anything that you would like to learn how to do, cheese making or otherwise, if you want to make it from scratch in the kitchen, send me a note, let me know. We'll see what we can do about it, getting a video up for you. All right, take care. Thanks so much for joining me. Bye-bye.